Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever wanted something really, really bad that didn't belong to you? Maybe it was something your neighbor had, a cool toy, or maybe it was a power tool, or a car. Remember when I was a kid, I used to I don't know if you ever remember East Bay magazines. I loved looking at the shoes, even though my dad was never going to pay for shoes that were more than $45. And I think every shoe in that catalog was more than $45. But I really wanted one. Have you ever had something like that? Something you really, really wanted, but it didn't belong to you. In the Ten Commandments, the last two commandments deal with this desire. The biblical word for that desire and that feeling is covet. Now, it becomes covet when you want it so bad that you're willing and you think that you ought to have it even though it isn't yours. And we've been coveting since the very beginning. If you eat this, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What is that but coveting God's position and authority? We wanted it for ourselves even though it wasn't given. And we covet still today. Well, in our gospel reading, Jesus tells us a parable about a group of covetous, violent, murdering tenants. And they will do anything to get something and hold on to something that doesn't belong to them. But before we get into that particular story, we need to set the context for Luke chapter 20. And the context is this. Things are reaching a boiling point between Jesus and the religious leaders in Jerusalem. In the previous chapter, Jesus made his triumphal entry He's too popular with the people. His status from mere nuisance has been elevated to genuine threat to the established order. And we know from the end of chapter 19 that the religious leaders of Jerusalem, because of this, were trying to destroy Jesus. That's the word they used. They were trying, seeking ways to destroy him. They wanted to embarrass him publicly and trick him into committing a crime that they could charge him with. So right before we get to this parable, the exchange is the Pharisees ask Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? And Jesus, knowing their intentions, asks them a question back And he says, was John's baptism from God or from man? And because they're afraid of the people, they they don't respond because they know that the people really love John, so they're not going to denounce his baptism. But if they say he's from God, then they're giving credence to what they don't want to admit to. And so they say nothing. And Jesus says, neither will I answer your question. So much for the soft, cuddly Jesus. And then we get to our gospel reading for today. Right after that, it says, Jesus began to tell the people this parable. So he's got a particular audience here. And we know from the end of the text section that it does tell us that they perceived that this might be about them. Jesus isn't pulling any punches. So we get to the parable, and the setting for the parable is a vineyard, an image, imagery used to describe the people of God, Israel, the covenant people. And it says, a man planted a vineyard, and he rents it out to tenants, and he plans to be gone for a long time. Now, in that setup, the big question throughout this whole thing is, who owns the vineyard? To whom does it belong And what should it do? Well, the man who's planted the vineyard would be called the landlord in a tenant agreement. And a tenant 
is somebody who occupies land or property rented from a landlord. So by the very title they're given, we know they don't own the vineyard. It doesn't belong to them. But the story continues. When harvest time comes, when the right time is going to come, when the, the plants are going to bear their fruit, the landlord sends a servant to collect the harvest. After all, it's his vineyard. What do you think he's expecting to happen when he sends his servant to these tenants who he's let his vineyard out to? He expects to receive the fruit. After all, that's what he's paying them for. That's what they've rented this place out for. That's why they became tenants. But what happens? The tenants covet that which does not belong to them, and the master's away, so they think they can get away with it. Sort of foolish. We'll see how it goes. And it says they beat him, the servant that the master sent, and sent him away empty-handed. So our tenants are selfish, covetous, they're doing something illegal, and they're violent to say the least. What do you think the landlord is going to do? Now imagine if Jesus is telling this parable and he stops right there and asks his audience that question. You don't know the rest of it, but you stop after the first servant he sent back got beat up and sent away empty-handed. What do you think the landlord is going to do? What do you think he should do? Well, if we're being honest, I think what we would say is they're done. The, uh, they've obviously violated the tenant agreement, so they're going to get kicked off the land but that's not what the landlord does. What does he do? He sends another servant. Despite his other servant being beaten up and returning empty-handed, he didn't even get the fruits he sent him for. He sends another servant. Why would the landlord do that? It makes no sense. It doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make good sense. Does he not care about the well-being of his servants? or the vineyard for that matter, but he sends another servant, and that servant is beaten up and treated shamefully, and then we would ask the question again, what, what do you think the landlord should do? Imagine if Jesus stopped his parable again and asked that same question of the audience. And again, we would be stymied because we would think, surely this time those tenants are going to get it. But he sends a third servant. And this one is wounded and cast out. Now notice that what is done to each of the servants escalates each time. The first one is beaten and is leaves empty-handed. The second one is beaten and treated shamefully. And the third is wounded and cast out. Our tenants are getting bolder. They think... They own the place. They think they're getting away with what they're doing. And at this point, he sent three servants. What do you think the landlord is going to do? And again, we would be stymied. We wouldn't understand the landlord's behavior because we would assume, surely this time, he's going to oust those wicked tenants. They're going to get the justice they deserve. But then the landlord does something even more radically generous than we would ever conceive. He sends his beloved son, his son whom he loves, despite knowing that the tenants have treated his servants shamefully and that they seem to be escalating in their despicable behavior. And instead of doing what would have been his right as the landlord, the law and the community would have been on his side, justice would have been done, and he would have been right to do so. Yet he doesn't pursue that. He sends his son. Surely they'll listen to him. And 
what happened? Well, the violence has been escalating, and now it reaches its ultimate conclusion. The sun shows up, and they kill him. Now, each time, the landlord has given them an opportunity to turn away from their behavior, to turn away from this violation of the state of things. The vineyard doesn't really belong to them, even though they're behaving like it does. And the master is never not in control. The landlord is never not in ownership of the vineyard. And yet they think that they're in charge. But they think it belongs to them. They covet the thing that doesn't belong to them. And we can see this when they speak among themselves. When the sun shows up, we are told the reason that they kill him. They say, oh, here's the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. Let us kill him so that we can get what doesn't belong to us. We're going to take it. Now, at this point, after the landlord sends his son and his son is killed, we don't have to pause and ask the hypothetical question anymore because Jesus asks it of his listeners himself. He says, what then will the owner of the vineyard do? And we find out that this is a rhetorical question. He's not actually asking the audience because he answers his own question right away. What will the owner of the vineyard do? And Jesus answers immediately, he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And again, this is sort of unexpected. He doesn't say he's going to kick them out and throw them in jail. He says, they will be destroyed. For we're no longer talking about the earthly justice that we meet out on one another, but God's righteous judgment, and it is total and complete and absolute. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now, this parable is clearly intended to specifically address the religious leaders of Jerusalem. Even some of the specific language in the parable tells us that because it says what's going to happen to the son? The son is going to be cast out of the vineyard like Jesus is cast out of Jerusalem and killed. And Jerusalem is the city of God, the place where God has made his dwelling among his people because that's where the temple resides. And yet the religious leaders of Jerusalem think that it belongs to them. And if we think of the servants that are sent by the landlord, we think back in the Old Testament to the prophets sent to the people of God to gather them back to him. And many of them are treated shamefully and despised, wounded, beaten up, and cast out. And finally, the Son, Jesus, is sent, and He is killed. Now, while this parable is specific to the audience that Jesus is speaking to, there's also lessons from it that we can learn. While this is a rebuke of the religious leaders, it can also be a rebuke of the old Adam within each one of us, who seeks to despise God's Word who seeks to reject those whom he sends to you. Because if we're honest, at times we all turn away from God's word. We all, at times, reject those who are sent to give it to us. Particularly when it's a word we don't want to hear, which is like, hey, I've come to gather the fruit of the garden for the landlord, and you think the fruit belongs to you. It doesn't belong to you. God. But we don't just learn about God's demeanor as far as his wrath at the end of the parable. We also learn about 
his sort of irrational, well, not sort of, completely irrational mercy and patience. At every step of that parable, if we stop it after each instance where a servant of God is sent to the people, you would think he has every reason and right and ought, and if we were in his situation, we probably would do this, to get rid of the tenants immediately. For they have despised the relationship that the master of the vineyard established with them. They've despised his property, and they've despised the people that he sent to collect what is his. And yet, at each instance, he gives them another chance. He sends another servant. The only possible explanation can be that he's giving the tenants another opportunity to do what they agreed to do, to behave as tenants ought to behave. And yet, each time it gets worse. And at their worst, when surely, if you weren't going to do it the first time or even the second, after the third, you would give up on these tenants. After the third, nobody would criticize you for kicking them out and arresting them. And yet, the landlord sends his son. He sends his son, his beloved son, the text tells us, into a den of violent, covetous murderers. That's what God was doing when he sent Jesus into our sinful and fallen world. It's not like he didn't know what was going to happen to him. It's not like he didn't know that he would be rejected. He knew all of those things, and yet still he sent him. To understand, dear friends in Christ, this is God's mercy on display for you. That our God is patient, He's long suffering, quick to forgive and love. But the wrath doesn't go away, the judgment isn't erased by the mercy. We've encountered a few gospel accounts in Luke so far this year that have this twofold message. God is merciful and loving and forgiving. Hear his word, repent, and receive the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. But that time will not be forever. The axe is laid at the root of the trees, John the Baptist says. And here, the master of the vineyard, after the death of his son, is going to return and it's not going to go well for the tenants. So what does this mean for us? It means we best be about hearing God's word today. Through the hearing of that word and the experiencing of the love of God, which he has sent after you, he has pursued you with, you're brought to repentance and faith. You receive the forgiveness of sins, and then he continues to nourish that faith through his gifts. Don't put this off. Don't think you have lots of time, for we don't know when the time of mercy will be done, but we do know that it will, it will end. This time of mercy is not forever, for judgment day does still come. But take heart as well, for our Lord has far more patience than we do. He has far greater mercy than we ever could, and much greater love. And this is demonstrated by the fact that when he sends his most beloved son is when the tenants have escalated the most. They're not looking for the son. They'd rather him not show up. In fact, when he does show up, they come up with a diabolical plan to kill him so that they can take what they think they should get. And the amazing mercy and love of our God is that he uses his son's death to buy our life. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why he entered Jerusalem knowing what awaited him there. Because he loves you. God is pursuing you because of that love. He is reaching out to you. He is sending those people into your life to bear his word. Because he loves you, he desires your repentance, forgiveness, and he wants to live with you forever. So dear friends in Christ, Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he went into a den of evil 
and suffered the death that we deserved as the wicked tenants of that place so that we could live forever with him. Don't wait. Turn, repent, hear God's word, and receive this wondrous gift of grace in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.